Of all the Earth's large land masses, North America has the most remarkable system of interior waterways. They are the Great Lakes. Being connected to each other and the Atlantic Ocean, they offer a water route reaching over a thousand miles into a region with vast natural resources, major population centers, and intensive industrial development. Lake ships loaded with iron ore, coal, grains, and many other commodities supply raw materials and carry the products of important cities like Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, Buffalo, and many others. Lake transportation has had a major part in making these cities among the largest in America. This is the traffic pattern of the Great Lakes, the line's width indicating the approximate volume of cargo. The St. Lawrence River drains the lakes and connects them with the vast ocean commerce. Yet only a thin trickle of shipping joins the lakes with ocean trade through this outlet. Two natural barriers limit this traffic. The first is Niagara Falls. The waters draining Lake Erie flow swiftly across the Niagara Isthmus, finally becoming a rapid. And then pouring over a bluff in a 160-foot waterfall. Below the falls are more rapids. For almost 300 years, man has struggled to get ships past this obstacle. As early as 1824, a canal with 39 locks was built to bypass the waterfall. The canal was repeatedly enlarged as lake traffic increased. In 1932, the fourth and newest canal was finished. It is the Welland Ship Canal. For many miles, the canal runs across the flat upper level of the isthmus. The Welland Canal is entirely on the Canadian side of the Great Lakes. It descends the high bluff in a series of seven locks. At the steepest portion, three locks are connected end to end. To speed traffic, a double flight of locks has been built at this point. The double locks can handle ships in both directions simultaneously. A canal lock is a chamber separated from upper and lower canal water levels by a watertight gate. To lower a ship, a lock is filled to the upper level. The upper gates open and the ship enters. When the gates are closed, a heavy cable beneath this steel boom prevents ships from drifting and damaging lock gates. The water is drained through tunnels under the locks. When the level equals the lower canal, the lower gates open and the ship sails out. The routine is reversed to raise a ship. In this empty lock, the concrete shelf below the gates is an extension of the floor of the canal above the lock. When the lock is filled, a ship drawing 30 feet of water can sail over that shelf. Water fills the locks by gravity from the canal above. Electric power allows one man to operate the huge gates and valves for each lock. Each of the seven main locks has a lift of over 46 feet. It requires about 20 minutes to raise or lower a ship. Therefore, the camera has speeded up this lock's action 100 times to show the routine more clearly. With this splendid canal, large ships can easily pass around Niagara Falls. But the route to the sea is still not open. After crossing Lake Ontario, ships meet an equally difficult obstacle in the St. Lawrence River. Below Lake Ontario, the river channel is separated by many islands. 
Here, the beginning of a swift current may be seen. A short distance downstream, the current is still more rapid. This tanker's speed is only slightly faster than the current near the riverbank. When it accidentally swings out into the swifter main current, the steamer is carried downstream, backward. Not until the ship regains the slower side current can it again move upstream. Rapids in many sections of the river make navigation impossible. At such places, canals run beside the river. Occasionally, they must step through a lock to remain at river level. These locks were built many years ago when ships were small and traffic light. Today, they're extremely inadequate. Many of the locks have old wooden gates which are opened and closed by hand winches. The flow of water is controlled by hand-operated valves. Ships in the St. Lawrence trade are often built to the maximum size which will fit these locks. No safety cable protects the lock gate. A lookout on the ship calls back to men operating the mooring winches in order that the ship may be stopped just a few inches from the gate. Yet there is barely room at the stern for the lower gates to close. Tight mooring lines are needed to prevent the ship from drifting into the gate. Some locks are operated by a crude power system. A few are fairly modern, yet even these cannot compare with the Welland Canal. The largest Great Lakes steamers are over 600 feet long, and the Welland locks about 200 feet longer. But the St. Lawrence locks are only 270 feet long and 14 feet deep, far too small for either Great Lakes or ocean freighters. This, then, is the effective barrier. These small locks prevent the full use of the modern Welland Canal, and so large ships still cannot reach the sea. The St. Lawrence canals have not been improved mainly due to the cost of enlarging. Both canals are in Canada, but the United States has much more shipping and a vastly larger population on the lakes than Canada, and therefore is expected to pay over half the cost. Such an expenditure has not been approved, nor is there agreement on the exact plan. At present, in 113 miles of river, there are 48 miles of rapids bypassed by six canals, each with several locks. The lowermost are at the Lachine Rapids, opposite the city of Montreal. 400 years ago, these rapids barred the French explorers' easy progress upstream, so they established Montreal at this spot. The last of the locks thread between the city's waterfront buildings, the small St. Lawrence steamers at last reach deep water. The docks of Montreal moor ocean freighters from seaports all over the world. Behind this line, looking tiny in comparison, is one of the St. Lawrence steamers. At Montreal, almost all cargoes must be transferred between ships or railways. Here is Canadian wheat. It was grown hundreds of miles inland and is now being loaded on a ship bound for Europe. These boxes of paper are going to New Zealand. These automobile tires to England. Bars of copper go aboard another ship. All these things come from the Great Lakes area. It would be much cheaper and faster for man if this handling were not necessary. But these products and countless others whether being sent to or from the Great Lakes region by sea, must be transshipped because of the St. Lawrence barrier to direct shipment. Below Montreal, a dredged channel accommodates all but the largest ships, and below Quebec, the natural river depth will float the greatest ships built. The St. Lawrence widens and deepens for 400 miles. And then at last, the waters of the Great Lakes meet the sea. But the traffic of the lakes has not met the traffic of the sea in any large volume because of the two obstacles. The Niagara Falls barrier has been overcome by the modern Welland Canal. Eventually, the canals and locks of the St. Lawrence will be enlarged. 
Then Midwestern cities a thousand miles from the Atlantic will become seaports. Lowered shipping costs to this great market will aid American industry and agriculture and the use of Midwestern resources. Removing the last barrier between the Great Lakes and the sea will benefit every American in some way and have a favorable influence on the economy of many nations.